There we go. All right, uh, welcome to the DXDAO community call for October 28th. Uh, this one's starting a little bit early at 14.30 UTC uh, to, to match up with the launch of the next Epochs on Swapper uh, going live at 1500 UTC. And so thanks everyone for joining. It's taking people a little bit of a, uh, some time to get back into the swing of things. A lot of people have been traveling. Uh, there were quite a few attendees during ETH Lisbon Blockchain Week. Um, and a handful of people, including Keenan and myself and a few others are all sick, uh, hopefully not COVID things, but bugs and, and, uh, and, and sicknesses that we are uh, getting over. But I will be taking uh, care of this meeting uh, while Keenan is here. He's, he's resting his voice too. So I'm just gonna go over the agenda for today's community call, which is uh, starting with the DXD buyback extension proposal which is a continuation of the of the program that DXDAO has been executing for I think a number of uh, like almost like five or six months now. Uh, next we have some swapper farming updates uh, for today October 28th which uh, will uh, be similar to what we've been doing the last uh, number of epochs but it's uh, on Arbitrum, Mainnet and XDAI and so some updates there. At 1500 UTC is when the swapper farms go live, so maybe people uh, will be moving liquidity around and between uh, uh, farms and things then, and we can talk about that. Uh, then we also have a recap of uh, some of the events in, in, uh, in Lisbon that happened the last couple weeks. Um, there was a, a DSDAO retreat. Um, there was a, a, the Taoist event, which is a very Dao community focused event, which uh, DXDAO was a part of. Then there was LizCon, which was a giant main event of the week. And then there was also a, a DXDAO hosted kind of happy hour and, and panel on the future of prediction markets. And so we can talk a little bit about that. And then we'll have time for open questions. And so to kick things off, uh, I think we'd probably like to invite uh, Powers to the stage, but there is uh, the DXD buyback extension proposal, which is live, uh, which has a number of details and, and updates. And if, if uh, Chris, I think you should just be able to join. Yep, great. Um, if you want to give an update on kind of where we are and, and what the deal is with, the, with that proposal, um, that'd be great. Cool, thanks. I was caught in the curtain off stage, but it's yeah. great to be here. Um, happy fall, everyone. Um, so uh, a couple days ago, I posted uh, draft text for uh, DXD buyback extension number three. Um, so this would increase the program from 3 million uh, maximum to 4 million. Um, not that different than the previous two extensions uh, in terms of kind of what it uh, authorizes. It gives updated numbers and that, but I did just want to go over uh, a couple things uh, here. So first to share uh, the spreadsheet that kind of uh, tracks this. So right now, um, so far the program has uh, purchased 6,313 DXD, um, which at the time of purchase is about $2.7 million. And then um, right now that DXD is worth about 4.2 uh, million. The average uh, ETH DXD price for uh, the 6,300 DXD is uh, 0 0.151 uh, ETH to DXD. Um, and as Sky said, this program has actually been going on for five months. So the first order was executed on May 15th. Um, and over that five months, we, there have been 80 separate orders. Um, and that actually comes out to be just about one every other day um, through that. Um, and then in terms of uh, trading uh, volume, I'm going to share a image here. Um, just some recent uh, DXD trading volume um, over the last uh, month or so. You can see a couple of big spikes um, here and there. And you can, uh, I think this is a, a fun chart to see how 
uh, volume has shifted across the different uh, exchanges, um, especially considering Swapper is on multiple uh, exchanges there. As you can see, kind of both XDAI, Mainnet, and now Arbitrum have all had at some point been the largest DXD trading volume over the last uh, several months. Um, there has been a little bit of an increase of the average trading volume over the, the last couple of weeks. Um, it actually tends to be, if you look at the numbers, uh, like very little on the weekends. Uh, there's like some days on the weekends, there's like 100 or $500, uh, and that kind of brings it down. Uh, but there's been a little bit of an increase there. So you can see uh, the 25% of daily volume will be about 40000 um, there. And then, yeah, the buyback extension proposal, as I said, is is pretty uh, similar to the the previous ones. Um, and so, there's I don't think there's anything too controversial in there. Um, we can kind of use it as a opportunity to signal other intentions about um, DXD and, and the buyback program. But um, right now, this one is mostly just about extending it to the the four million. Um, elsewhere, outside of the extension draft proposal, um, there is some conversation about how we. Uh, move forward to another system or another method to conduct the buyback outside of relying on uh, Gnosis Protocol V1. Um, so um, there's a kind of both a relayer being used and also seeing if we can use Aqua um, to implement that. So maybe that's uh, the kind of a medium term uh, plan there in, in thinking about that. Um, but yeah, this is an extension uh, draft proposal that I think we'll try to maybe get up in the forum. I mean, sorry, in on the uh, DX vote in the next day or so, um, so that it can uh, pass before we reach three million. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, so just related to that, uh, after if this proposal passes and is executed, we'll cross like a four million dollar threshold of of um, dollar value of buybacks. How are how are people thinking about like? Uh, the maximum or like a, a like how to analyze a continuation of the program um in general yeah i think it's um you know given how long it's been going on and also like how long as dxd has been around i think it's important to kind of look at the issuance of that and so um there has been 600 300 6, purchase um but dxdao has also issued 920 dxd so some of this is contributors, uh, and then some of this has been to uh, LPs for Swapper Farming Rewards. And there's probably another 950 DXD that um, has not been distributed to contributors investing contracts. Um, so you can see there that we've kind of shrunk the supply of DXD by, you could say, 4,000 uh, DXD, 4,200 DXD over the last um, five months. Um, and that's about 10% of the circulating supply. And so right now, if you look at the circulating supply. So uh, if you look at CoinGecko, that actually still includes the DXD that has been repurchased um, because uh, most of it's on XDAI in the base there, but uh, Coin to CoinGecko, it's just on the bridge uh, there. Um, so if you actually use the circulating supply, um, which would subtract that, that would be 43,583 um, that is not owned by DXDAO. And that represents a market cap right now of $30 million. Um, and that's still you know, pretty comfortably below the value of ETH and stables in the DXDAO treasury, which is $65 million. Um, so to me, it seems like there is, uh, and that's not to even include the, the ETH and the buyback reserve. Um, and so I think that this seems like kind of a, uh, a comfortable position to be in, even though it has... Um, you know, taken time. There has been a lot of purchases in light of kind of the broader treasury movements. It has not been a noticeable effect on like the, the treasury makeup because um, it only is used 950 ETH, which is, I don't know, like maybe seven or eight percent of the ETH um, in the treasury. And then that's actually increased the value of the DXD in the treasury there. Um, Anyway, I guess I'm not really answering your question uh, in terms of how long to continue. I think we need to think of more about what is the automated way that we do these buybacks in the future. So part of this is automating like the work that Dave uh, and others are doing in terms of submitting proposals, looking at the average daily trading volume, looking at the circulating um, supply and how can we automate that. But also like what are the what's the the method that this is is doing? So 
Um, I feel like that's the way that's the conversation we should be having. Um, and yeah, and and for right now, it seems to be we can continue on the current course and the current methods we have, um, but shifting to to that other method sometime. Cool. So yeah, and and the, the cadence of every million dollars or so, which obviously changes as as prices changes, and and can alter the timing, but that seems to be a good cadence for kind of reevaluation for the next um, kind of period. Um, there's no known reason to like slow or slow down or speed that up. So that, that, that seems to be going well. Right. Like I think to your point, like that every million dollars, like we get to ask ourselves this question that you're asking here. And like just that asking the question, I think is a healthy exercise. Yeah. And if, if any community members um, or, or contributors or whatever are aware of other projects that are, um, you know, analyzing the same, situation or something similar and and uh, you know we've we know that some projects have done buybacks with different tools and things and have tested different things but if there's there's obviously always so much happening and new information coming that if anyone ha sees other interesting uh things that are happening around like buybacks or like native token buybacks for a project yeah it would be great to share that in the in the chats in the in the forum cool uh Great, thanks, Chris. Um, so next we uh, will, okay, we have 15 minutes till the next uh, Farming Epochs launch. And so we will dive a little bit into kind of the updates around these next, uh, this next Epochs uh, and, and campaigns. Um, we, we were, we haven't, so it hasn't been published yet, but if you've been following in, you know, chats and forums and things, you, you may have a sense of what the the next campaigns look like and and almost all of them are live as upcoming in the swapper staking uh ui there's one uh proposal that wasn't passed by majority uh which is could still potentially pass but we'll see um and so i guess to like take a view there's obviously arbitrum it has is continues to be the main focus with like a, a bunch of the core pairs that have always been there. There's a handful of new um, of new pairs that are are popping up in this epoch. The Arbitrum, the the swapper dedicated towards Arbitrum. This this epoch is 80% of the total swapper, and then there's another 10% for mainnet and another 10% for XDAI. Uh, the XDAI farms are really just these three core pairs again. Um, which are, I guess, in epoch two of four epochs. So these farms are running for a longer period of time just to save people uh, gas costs um, around moving staking. And then uh, XDAI, there's always some interesting, you know, XDAI is more niche, and, and but there's always interesting projects and interesting things happening uh, on XDAI. For example, the you know the house farm, like still one of the biggest house ETH pools on on uh, on XDAI Swapper, is is like an LP DAO that is farming the actual rewards, uh, you know, as a DAO. Um, there's a couple other interesting projects which have close connections to the XDAO, which is Agave, and then also Rice Token, which is um, which is uh, a DAO Square, which is kind of a a China region focused um, group out of the meta cartel ecosystem. And so, uh, yeah, there's interesting, you know, communities that exist on XDAI and, and need obviously liquid uh, liquidity pools for their token so that people have the option to get in and out. And so incentivizing some of those with swapper tokens is, does two things. It like, it attracts liquidity pool, but it also can end up bringing people from those communities into the DXDAO community and the Swapper community. And yeah, once we have Swapper, you know, guilds and things live, it will be interesting to see, you know, the number of people and where they're coming from that are participating in those. Um, was there anything else? Oh, yeah, if there's any questions about that, actually, I'm not looking at the chat, but uh, if there's any questions about that, uh, feel free to ask them in the chat. 
Um, oh, Keenan also shared the the medium post. Yams. Uh, what about yams? Um, ah, sweet. So yams is looking at potential um, buyback programs, which is interesting. So yeah, it would be great to connect with the the yams team. Um, back to uh, Swapper Farming. So there's one uh, one interesting topic that people have raised in the chats and also um, from some community questions where we see that with mainnet uh, where gas is really high, we the, there are some Swapper Farms that are lasting for like multiple epochs at, epochs at a time and that 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 works because there's known pairs that you know we want to have farms with and it makes it easier for people to just stay in those farms uh, for an extended period of time and so as we've progressed through some of the epochs with Arbitrum and XDAI which even though gas is cheaper and people can move back and forth between farms and we can be more nimble with starting up new farms and things there has been some discussion and questions and talk around should some of the core pairs that exist on Arbitrum and on XDAI, should we extend the the length um, of the farms so that you don't have to go in and out um, as a as a staker for those? And so that's that's an interesting question, and I think it does make sense for quite a quite a few of the pairs that are known that will be known, um, you know, rewards pairs. And if, if people want to join that conversation, come into the key base, um, figuring out which ones uh, should have extended periods is, a, is you know, up for discussion. And then it's also nice to be able to have shorter ones so that we can make like quicker, more nimble decisions around certain tokens that might pop up in the ecosystem or uh, you know, something changes or you know theoretically we could even start up farms like just you know outside of the cadence of epochs if there's like an immediate interest and so i don't know if chris or if anyone or um zet or anyone had any additional comments around that idea or vanky um that they wanted to speak to otherwise uh yeah that's kind of the summary No additional comments. So we did have uh, a few questions from the community um, <coughs> related. I guess maybe this one's related to what I just talked about. But someone asked, "What kind of large changes to the emissions are being discussed? Changing the two-week cadence, changing the per-chain allocation." introducing single-sided staking etc and so uh, i think to answer that uh, I, I mentioned the potential of changing the cadence of some of the epochs especially for core tokens and core pairs um, there is also talk about should you know the 80 10 10 percentages between arbitrum mainnet and xdi maintain uh, as is or is there some you know, reason to dedicate some additional swapper rewards to mainnet or to XDAI. Um, and so I think that's up for debate. Uh, yeah, you know, Arbitrum, you know, is it important for the future? I think there, like, there's still some hesitancy from in general from people to kind of just ape into Arbitrum and use and do a lot of things there in the DeFi space. There's this big withdrawal period, so then people. I think think about if I go there, then it's going to take me some time to come back to mainnet. Um, XDAI and you know similar to like some other side chains, the bridge is you know quite instant. There's a lot of interesting things happening on XDAI. There's new you know DAO communities and new projects that spin up very quickly on XDAI. And so, I th my, in my opinion, Swappers always had a view to really tie together with some of the smaller more interesting niche communities that are community owned in our greater ecosystem and like not necessarily like 
compete against Uniswap. That's not the goal. But if there are communities that are popping up uh, on XDAI and even on Arbitrum that that it makes sense to work with and help them like aim for a, a decent size liquidity pool on Swapper. Um, yeah, I think that there could be a reason to to reallocate some of the Swapper tokens towards that initiative. Um, yeah, any, let me check the next, any ETAs to share on the single side of staking? Is there a particular epoch being targeted? Good question by Xerox Spicy Soup. The, the staking, uh, single side staking as a, as a method of, you know, putting Swapper to work with and earning uh, a yield on that without like just dumping Swapper into the market that, that um, you know, yield aggregators or farmers can use. That's something we've been working on since the launch of, of farming. Uh, it's, I think, quite close to <coughs> being uh, ready to be kind of tested and used. Yeah, and as Vanky said, their contracts are being tested now. So my guess is that like, Hopefully, by the next epoch, we've made the progress we need to make and uh, and could include that as a, uh, I mean, theoretically, we can launch that even outside of epochs, right? When it's ready to go, I think that we will um, be able to launch it and make it known to the community that that is a, that is a live option um, in order to, like, you know, lock up your swapper and and earn a yield. And that will lead into the idea of swapper guilds where you're putting your swapper, you know, you're locking up your swapper, you're getting voting power in the guilds, you're also earning fees and <coughs> um, rewards from that. So it's kind of like a step in the direction of where we're already planning to, to head. And good question, what chains would uh, single size staking launch on f at first? XDAI is always the yeah, is always like the easiest, quickest testing ground, and that's where DXDAO has a decent sized presence. But uh, we could potentially do it on all three chains at the at the same time or or quickly after each other. So, um, and then Ross had shared a uh, link about. Um, fast withdrawals for Optimism and Arbitrum um, product that the UMA team, I believe, launched across protocol, which is interesting. And that ties in well with um, one of the goals of, of DXDAO and the Swapper team is to really make a UI and a user experience that, that makes bridging between these chains uh, very very friendly for a user and that can actually rely on other other project protocols whether it's the main net uh, like the main bridges of a, of a chain or <coughs> protocols launched by by other teams like a cross protocol or hop exchange or the connect what connects is doing and so if there is a really cool way to to give all of those options to a user you know that kind of that place could become uh, uh, somewhere where that users come to really figure out the best and, and easiest ways to move between all the different chains, which is going to become more and more important. <coughs> Sorry, excuse my coughing. All this talking isn't helping my throat. But all right, so in two minutes, we will the next. Campaigns will be going, uh, farms will be going live, and so maybe people will be diving into that uh, as it's happening. I can, I can give your uh, voice a break to make a quick comment about, because you had a question about the breakdown of chains, and I think XDAI really does seem to be, um, at least from like a rewards bang for buck or bang for volume, the most uh, efficient place for those. So um, I do think we should be considering it. And, and like, yeah. And, and I think there's a lot of other things kind of happening on XDAI and other communities, as you were mentioning, that we can kind of engage with. So I do think that's something 
that we should be uh, thinking about in terms of future rewards. Sweet. Uh... Yeah, so I guess next is, so we're about to go live uh, with the epochs. Um, <laughs> it's interesting to watch uh, watch what pairs, um, you know, Arbitrum has this, currently this like seven day exit period, right? And so in order for teams to, or people to take advantage of things that might happen on mainnet or XDAI, they might have it on Arbitrum. There's an interesting dynamic of like moving between the different um, farms on the different chains. And so I think it's not, it's not like if the reward is great on mainnet or on XDAI, it's like it automatically calls for like people to move capital from Arbitrum to those chains. So you're, I think at this point you're you're going after like whether it's swapper token or um, or other tokens. It's kind of you start you start with a, a base of what's on those chains and then uh, attract that liquidity. And so maybe that's um, on on the call earlier this morning. Some people were talking about there's a handful of pairs <coughs> that are also on Sushi Swap, for example, and the return, um, the APY is actually higher on on Swapper for the same pair than on Sushi Swap. Yet there will just be stagnant liquidity sitting on Sushi Swap for some of those pairs. And the question is, why is it um, is it like people are more familiar with Sushi Swap? Is it people aren't aware of the Swapper Camp farms? Is it that you know maybe they they prefer to farm sushi token instead of swapper token and so these are questions that we don't have all the answers to but as we do more of this i think we start to learn but yeah getting getting this information out into the in front of the faces of those people that are farming um i think it's really important to at least make people aware and sometimes there's websites for this where you can compare farms and things but we want to make sure that people are very aware of the of the of the farms that exist on Swapper um, on all three chains, especially if there's other pools that are have more liquidity that have lower rewards. <clears throat> Let's give everyone a minute to continue farming, I guess. Um, We need some farming music. Yeah, that's true. Uh, you know, the first ones into these farms get a really amazing return for like first 10 minutes. So don't forget. It seems to balance out rather quickly um, as long as people are paying attention. And there's interesting scenarios where there are yeah I, I think i mentioned this before but there are and this will probably happen more and more where there's there's groups of liquidity providers and that could be in a liquidity provider dao or it could be a team of liquidity providers or it could be a project that is built for organizing um liquidity provision and i think uh that like some of those are DAOs, right and and it's not as easy to like move your liquidity around between different pools and and farms as a DAO as it is if you're just an individual. So, giving you know, letting giving as much heads up to the communities that are partaking in the farms and also, you know, publishing it. You know, maybe we can try to publish it. The thing is, that our farms aren't really set until they're like actually set. So it's hard to publish too much information and we wouldn't want to publish incorrect information ahead of time but uh yeah we would do our best to to share as much information with the with anyone that would be interested in farming uh ahead of time so
So I guess that's, that's probably enough talk about Swapper for now. Uh, the next topic we have on the agenda <clears throat> is uh, events from Lisbon, uh, mainly uh, the Taoist LizCon. Well, we could start. So just to update everyone, DXDAO had a retreat or a number, like a, a bunch of the core contributors had a retreat the week before ETH Lisbon. Uh, in outside of Lisbon, uh, we there were lots of panel uh, or group discussions and working groups around the different squads of DXDAO. I think there was a lot of um, good updates and uh, valuable conversation and things that are coming out of that. Uh, also, ended up doing a uh, a workshop with a third party who helps kind of uh, navigate. The group through um, like work uh, discussions and like activities that help bring out like stuck things that are sticking that are that are causing things to stick or miscommunications and really getting everything out on the table and then presenting ways for a, a decentralized or distributed community to to solve those problems and. They've, you know, they have worked with DAOs in the past, but they just also work with like distributed companies that are all around that don't meet in an office in person. And there's like very uh, specific things that come up when you have that type of dynamic. And so, you know, a lot of DAOs in the space are are encountering the same issues and working through, and then hopefully, you know, publishing solutions and, and sharing those with each other and with other DAOs is a great way to like move the entire space forward and and I think most DAOs and projects in the space are like very happy to to work with and communicate with um, other projects in the space and so we can all kind of share um, yeah share information together um, and so yeah the Taoist was a really cool event uh, Chris Powers presented um, on uh, like g governance in a multi-chain world and really kind of broke down and compared what a number of projects are doing that are largely kind of liquid token based governance on mainnet and how they're handling multi-chain governance and there's a few different products and ways to do that and then kind of compare that to how DXDAO is able to do multi-chain governance with the, its reputational-based governance system, which is quite unique because you can just map, uh, you can map a snapshot of of the same wallets and same addresses and same voting power to any chain at any time, um, and they, you know, they can diverge from that point on, but there's ways to like match them back up and things like that, and so it really gives the XDAO a lot of flexibility to to govern well uh, its products in a multi-chain world. Chris, was there anything else you wanted to add on that? Oh, there's a video of the of the talk as well, which could be which should be shared on uh, on the channels. No, I thought that was it. You kind of hit it right on the head. Cool. Are there any other? Does anyone want to come up on stage and? Whether it's, it was a contributor or a community member or an attendee of any of the events during uh, during Lisbon Blockchain or ETH, ETH Week the, um, that people want to share highlights for someone or people or groups? Any, any unique things happen? Nope. So Liz, LizCon was a, was a really big event. It happened in the middle of the week last week. Uh, really a great opportunity to see all the different projects in the space, make connections, listen to some interesting talks. It was kind of big and open. And then this past weekend was the ETH Lisbon Hackathon, which DXDAO uh, had two teams um, enter and created a couple unique ideas. Did not actually win the hackathon, but made a good showing. 
and met other hackers and teams in the space. So uh, I think overall, it's cool to hear some comments like uh, people were like, oh, you're from DXDAO. Like, seems like there's like people all over from DXDAO. And uh, seems like you guys have a lot of people here or, oh, wow, you guys do, you know, your governance system sounds really cool. I saw the presentation. So just kind of, awareness of DXDAO, having a presence at these events, the bigger the bigger force you have, which, you know, maybe DXDAO had like a larger number of people there than some of the other communities and projects. So that's, that stands out. Um, you know, a lot of people just are at parties and having conversations and end up talking to someone and like, like once again, they're like, oh, you also contribute to DXDAO. That's, that's, that's amazing. Like, and and maybe that will draw up some interest into the community and additional um, from additional people. Um, someone asked, "Is uh, is DXDAO planning to attend other events?" And I think the answer in general is yes. Uh, some obviously Ethereum focused events are always really great and more focused. I don't know when. The next big ETH event is, it might be ETH Denver in uh, February, but it would be cool if like, you know, the whole DXDAO community shows up to the next big event. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and then there's some talk about ETH Barcelona. And there's some talk about ETH Tampa. And then there's also talk about when the next DevCon is happening. And then I think next year, um, you know, DXDAO participated in ETH Global's ETH Online Hackathon the last month, which was, um, you know, was it nice to participate? It didn't seem like much came out of it. I think some awareness came out of it, but like not, not many people were hacking on DXDAO's products. But uh, uh, so I, th I believe that ETH Global may start to do in person events again in 2022 and that could be a good opportunity for DXDAO to continue to uh you know sponsor and invest in the communities that show up to those events but i i don't know how many are planned so i'm not we're not really sure on how that's uh, proceeding just yet i hope everyone like showing up to the sky talks for the whole community call. <laughs> I feel like I feel like I've talked a lot. Um, and then one last thing, uh, I, I guess people are probably busy farming, but one last cool event that happened in Lisbon was DXDAO hosted a uh, a future of prediction markets panel. And we had some great guests. We had Stefan from Gnosis, Clement from Kleros. John uh, spoke on behalf of Omen and DXDAO. And I, and I kind of navigated the, uh, sorry, uh, hosted the panel. And we talked about, you know, the state of prediction markets and where we came from and like why we are where we are today. And that it's quite, you know, it is quite difficult. There's a lot of talk about prediction markets. People have been working on them for many, many years, and we're not to the point where like the world uses, you know, permissionless or blockchain-based prediction markets. Um, <clears throat> and kind of talked about like why we are there. Um, and then we also talked about uh, ideas for like what needs to happen to really help the space grow. And we also talked about like new interesting ideas and use cases for prediction markets, whether it's insurance or bounties or yeah, seeking info, like, projects paying to seek information. Um, <coughs> and uh, then we had uh, a happy hour where people could um, chat afterwards. There were actually a couple younger um, contributors who have actually contributed things to like poly market they were there and really interested in the way that dicks dow was approaching kind of open and permissionless prediction markets and then we also got a chance to drink some more of dicks dow's custom 
<clears throat> beer that it did with AMO Brewery based out of Lisbon. Um, and for those that got to taste that beer, you got a special POAP. Um, yeah, John, was there anything that you wanted to add about like, li li like Lisbon weeks or any of the events or anything? Yeah, I think you've made a, a great summary. I think it was, I mean, for me personally, it was just awesome to meet like, you know, I think half of the contributors I've been working with, some of which for almost a year in person, finally, for the first time. And then Lisbon was amazing, you know, great energy, just like endless events. I think we're all kind of exhausted and still recovering from that. And then the prediction market panel was was cool. I was pretty tired at this point in the week, but I think it was great to be up there with uh, Stefan um, from Gnosis and you know, Clement from Kleros and Sky did a great job moderating. Um, but yeah, just hearing, you know, I think especially Stefan, he's been very close to prediction markets on crypto from like the earliest days, right? Like him and Martin working on Bitcoin with their first project and then launching the GNO token sale in 2017. So it's great to kind of like have this sort of kind of like get together of like, I think Sky, you put it like some of the prediction market OGs on stage and just discuss kind of where things are currently. Like we talked a bit about, you know, capital efficiency, the importance of oracles, the current state of user experience for prediction markets. I think, you know, one of the things that was acknowledged is that uh, we still haven't got to a point where people are using them widely, right? It's still very niche and has certainly not like achieved any kind of widespread adoption yet. I think there was kind of like varying degrees of, of optimism on that. You know, I think Stefan was pointing out that a lot of projects have, have failed so far and, and, you know, even Gnosis, which set out doing their crowd sale explicitly to build prediction markets. I think Stefan said like, you know, they're doing literally everything these days except for prediction markets. Um, but of course, DXDAO wouldn't be where it is and today at all without Gnosis and in particular with Omen and prediction markets. And my personal take is that like, I think we still have a long ways to go and improving um, the user experience. I think there's still like a lot to do. And I think it's still really early for prediction markets in, in my mind. And I think we still um, like once we can achieve some of these advances and scalability and in onboarding. And I think one of the topics we talked about too is just reaching new audiences. Like once you know people are find it a little more accessible. I I still am very bullish on the future for prediction markets. And you know, I just want to like touch on the fact that of course we've done some reshuffling recently just to focus our limited dev resources on a couple of things and make sure that we're doing what we do well. And some of the development on Omen has been like currently paused, but the plan is to come back to that and kind of pick up development on Omen, you know, as soon as we are are ready and can can grow the dev team a little bit more. Um, were there any questions? Yeah, the beer was very good. Great job with the, uh, especially with the label design. Very cool. Kind of crazy. Thanks, John. Yeah, one other, uh, one other interesting thing that came out of it was that I, people kind of agreed that new experimental like use cases for prediction markets are something that could be really interesting, even if it's like very focused and niche. Um, it's worth experimenting with, and so that's hopefully something that if we gather ideas around that, as things kind of pick back up, we could potentially like focus on one or two of those kind of more experimental ideas and see if see how things like that stick um and so yeah pretty cool um there was also a sneak peek recording of something that was played at the event that was shared on twitter and yeah, people were asking when can they see the whole video that was uh, secretly shown. Um, I don't know if we have an answer for that, but keep an eye out for it.
All right. And so, all right, that was uh, pretty comprehensive. Oh, one just Ross was asking about the status of the liquidity mining on Omen markets. Um, and I would say, I think that's something that would go hand in hand with an Omen token. And so, like, the, the current focus has been on, on Swapper, and then we're looking at Carrot next. I think, like, the Omen token has not been forgotten, but I think it would be something that would go alongside the Omen token. And, like, personally, I think there's a couple of, like, UX things that we are hoping to address before we do that as well. Like, just making sure that liquidity providing is a little more intuitive for the user. Like, I think if you're new to it you get there and it's kind of like what happened to the capital like is it in the pool is it out of the pool and we have some ideas on how to fix that that we'd like to get to um in preparation for like launching um the token and, and other things around omen so i guess like to to make it short like yeah not not yet um was there any type of new was there any new type of liquidity mining for swapper using prediction markets and so not prediction markets but so this carrot yeah explain it like on five for carrot is a good question so i like to describe it as like programmable incentives and so think of it as like you can set up any question just like you can do an, like you can do an omen you can set up any question um and then you can put collateral behind that question and mint a new token, which we're calling the carrot token or like the KPI token. And then you can distribute that via farming or directly giving it out or even selling it if, if that was desired by the project or people doing this. Um, and then like when that question matures, like when it's answered by the Oracle, that carrot token is redeemable for the underlying collateral if that condition is met. So it could be something like, you know, will, um, agave be uh, the like the capital locked in the agave platform on next time. Will that exceed ten million dollars by the end of the year, right? And will it average that number over the course of December? So, like, if that's the question, um, you know, you could put reward tokens like agave into the carrot platform and issue the the KPI tokens via like basically farming like some kind of staking on the agave platform or you could do it via farming on the swapper platform or like i said you could just send it out or sell it um and then when the time comes like if that goal is met like if that kpi is met then the recipients of that carrot token can redeem it for the underlying agave or collateral so yeah i like to describe it as programmable incentives you could think of it as like an advancement on yield farming or incentives, like making it more nuanced, giving projects a better bang for their buck, giving projects more control over how they distribute their incentives. So yeah, something very exciting where we've been testing the kind of MVP, the prototype of Carrot and looking to get it launched hopefully in the next month. So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about that and look for more info on that as well. Great, thanks, John. Um, I think that that uh, we can sweet like the name. Yeah, it. I think it kind of works. Um, can work a bit like uh, you may KPI options. Um, the idea is that it's like much simpler to use. I think too, like anyone's going to be able to come and uh, easily make these conditional type tokens um kpi tokens and it can really expand but we can follow that as it goes along but thanks everyone for joining the dxdao community call on october 28th um if you have any follow-up questions or things yeah feel free to put them in the chats come discuss any of these ideas and uh, on the forum or in the, any of the channels so thanks everyone for coming Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sky, for emceeing. Talk to you later. Bye, everyone.